Maybe he can stay in. Well, just go turn the lights back on. Uh, Why did you want to go to sleep? Welcome. Uh, my name is Rex Bay Penn. Uh, a lot of people call me Rex. The students, the upper bound students, uh, go by my nickname, Rex. And uh, I'm the co chair of the Affirmative Action Committee. And I'm also uh, the advisor to the Asian Student Association with, with Sarah Morrow. Um, and today, we're really privileged and honored to have Ravita, a uh, long time standing professor here and the chair yeah, of the Department of uh, Early Childhood Education, mm -hmm. with us. And she's going to do an outstanding, I'm sure, outstanding mm -hmm. workshop, interactive mm -hmm. workshop mm -hmm. on oh, finding your identity and also your inspiration yeah. for who you really are. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, first off, I just want to thank uh, Sarah. This is our third, actually, um, Asian American, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month celebration. And Sarah's the one who came out with the idea uh, to even celebrate Asian Heritage Month because a lot of people don't know about it. But it actually occurs in May. Uh, but because of final exam week, we have to do it in April. Oh. Um, so uh, Sarah is the reason for this celebration. And uh, also, <laughs> also uh, for the biggest idea of them all uh, for uh, our next week uh, event for Daniel Coe. So I wanted to give credit where it's due. And um, I, I thank her a lot for helping me, for mentoring me and also for making this. We're very happy to have Ravita here. Yeah. Oh, and Ravita. Ravita. <laughs> um, so a little bit about Ravita. Uh, what is, oh, I guess <laughs> Just a little bit. I don't want to embarrass her. Right. <laughs> She's I very modest. Her. Yes, <laughs> um, I don't know about that. But, mm. She got a master's uh, oh. from Wheelock College mm -hmm. um, in leadership, and she got a PhD, a uh, doctor in education, uh, in uh, adult development mm -hmm. okay, uh, education. So. Uh, as I said again, long time standing faculty, uh, champion for diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see that throughout her published uh, newsletters and articles. And also she won a lot of awards, but just to name two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Center for uh, Creative Leadership Scholarship. She, uh, and also the President Faculty Award um, from Mon Ida College in Newton, Mass. So, and she has certificate in uh, dismantling racism uh, foundation of leadership. So this is the perfect person to do oh, an identity geez. workshop. <laughs> I hand it over for, to Rapita. Well, <laughs> thanks, thanks Rex, and uh, thanks Sarah. I mean, I think he has set me up so high. I'm so afraid that now your expectations have gone way up over there. So he's probably setting me up for <laughs> what I don't know. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here because, um, like he said, this is certainly. Uh, Maybe this is something I have learned. Maybe I should say a tiny bit why I am the way I am at this point. <laughs> um, well, like many of you, you will go to school, college, and you don't think a whole lot about what you're being exposed to until you really live in the real world. And um, for some of you, um, so maybe I learned most about living in the United States is maybe traveling to 35 different states and trying to create uh, professional development systems for early childhood education. So our charge was to engage as many of the stakeholders as we could in each state. And often it was always hardest to get those who are um, invisible at the table of decision making. So maybe uh, much of what I'm sharing with you at the PowerPoint, which will be later, probably that's the source for me. So probably even going getting a master's and doctorate wasn't that much of an education as much as going out, interacting with people, processing that. That was my biggest education, I would say. Uh, but we all need this paper qualification. So you should go to college. Don't deny yourself that, because without that, you have no leverage in society. <laughs> um, so I don't know if all of you have had a chance to be, and you know our topic for today is really individual identity and humanity, because I think all of us are looking at, I guess since your birth, everyone is trying to make you into someone. And in the process, you are also trying to make yourself into someone. and. Uh, I guess it is a lifelong process. So we're starting with individual identity, and we're thinking about humanity because we all live in groups, whether it's family, neighborhoods, um, what else? What would you add to that? Neighborhood and state, and then you have nationhood, and then ultimately we're all just on the planet, right? So in a way, we, have a, we, have, we belong in many different circles, so to speak, right? So that's why we have, I know some of you came here a little late, but not to leave you out, 
Um, maybe somebody could help me, Rex, or someone. So we're going to give you some post-it notes. For those of you who didn't acknowledge your arrival over here, we're going to first start looking at who am I. Both, you can do two post-it notes. On one, you're just going to write a word that, only for those who have not already responded, is who am I in terms of uh, how you see yourself. And uh, on another post-it note, you can write words that maybe how other people see you. Okay, um, the reason we're doing that is because that's how I guess we're all forming our identities. <laughs> or some of us have already crystallized our identity to some extent, at least the exterior, but we can still work on the interior aspect of ourselves. Um, so let's see what's over here. Okay, this, this one over here, it says, who am I according to others? That means how others perceive you, right? Um, proud of myself as a jokester, warm-hearted, optimistic, random, friend, unique, antisocial, smart, <laughs> beautiful, kind, loud, funny, obnoxious, okay? <laughs> So that's how others are perceived, flamboyant. That's interesting, okay. Um, so that's how other people are seeing certain people, right? And then according to me, I don't know if somebody, maybe I should, maybe I should walk up or maybe somebody wants to read it. Let me see what it says there. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> okay, over here it says, I'm perceived as mom, wife, professional, doctoral student, antisocial, dancer, singer, daughter, student, singer, sister, student, artist, friend, student, daughter, singer, friend, daughter, student, funny, honest, artistic, hmm. learning and teaching, I don't know, I can't recognize one of them. Indecisive and awkward. Um, some people are being really downright honest, which is refreshing. <laughs> and um, and uh, normally if this was like a three-day thing, we would get deeper into it, into smaller groups. But I think what we are looking at is how other people see you. And, um, and do you, uh, partly one aspect we want to think about do you see yourself the way others see you? Does anybody want to respond to that? Any brave souls? Yeah. Um, I guess um, from what people told me, they say uh, I'm a guy with confidence. And if you see, if you look at uh, who am I, I put flamboyant, which means uh, someone who attracted other with confidence and stylish. Yeah. Because uh, I like to dress up a lot. Because the way I dress is how I like to pre present myself to others. Because mm -hmm. appearance is everything from how I expect it. So uh, when they told me that I'm a confident person, whatever they told me, that's what I believe. Because I get that a, a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But do you agree that you are flamboyant? Yeah. Is that what they say? And you agree with that? Yeah. So th yeah. That's good that it is in sync, right? But sometimes the way others see you and you see yourself is not in sync. And when there is that kind of dissonance, then you're probably trying to figure out where is that coming from? Am I really that? Could I be something else? And how come they see you like that, right? So uh, that's what identity is about. And where do you think you get your initial messages of identity? Surprises. Others, yeah. Who might be your first circle of others? Family. 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 So do any of you have any interesting anecdotes about nicknames that I've given to you that you want to shake off but it's still stuck? <laughs> marshmallow. Yeah. You want to say? Go ahead. Marshmallow. You said marshmallow. <laughs> and do you want to say what? Kodesh. Say that? Kodesh. Kodesh. What does that mean? It's young, the youngest. Basically. Youngest. Kode. And what language is that? Creole. Oh, Creole. Oh, okay. Youngest. That means you're... And sometimes, I don't know, what would be the context for saying marshmallow? Uh, wait, what is, nice. sorry? Too nice, too sweet. 
Say that again? Too nice and sweet. Oh, too nice and sweet. Oh, sorry if I see that's a cultural gap, right? Because I don't understand what marshmallow means. But he's saying the reason they give him the nickname marshmallow is because he's too kind and too sweet. And that might also be that you're very flexible, easygoing, you give it, it might have all those meanings, right? So in a way, when you get those messages very early, sometimes we internalize that, and then we begin to be that sometimes, right? And maybe you, even though you have shaken it off, sometimes <laughs> the family and friends haven't shaken that image off of you. So it's kind of really tough, because you want to be seen and accepted, maybe as a young adult, somebody who's making decisions who is strong, and maybe they're still seeing you as a marshmallow. So somebody whom, and also they feel then they can still manipulate you maybe or tell you what to do. And so there is the friction of identity, right? But the same things can apply in the circles of, uh, maybe if you belong to some affinity groups, whether you belong to certain clubs or churches, the same thing can be carried over. And the same thing can, it also depends if you're working, how people at work perceive you, right? So. I don't want to be lecturing here, but the other piece we have right now is I would like to have a couple of volunteers. And maybe if you raise your hands, I need only two. Um, we're going to do an icebreaker, and we need the audience participation. So I need a bit, two brave souls, kind of. Uh, um, OK, I'll take you in the blue shirt. Your name? Peter. Peter? OK. Peter, and which hands were up here? Any one of you can come up here? Any one of you? Anyone? Okay, let's. Okay, come. You go. Let's go. <laughs> I need Peter and Taylor. Taylor. Oh, Kayla. Taylor. Okay. Taylor. Taylor. Okay. Uh, you're really brave, right? Yeah. So you're not going to feel hurt. This is all just for an exercise. <laughs> okay. And the audience also has to participate. And the way it works is um, the two of them are going to face outward. So your backs are to each other this way, sideways, so they can see you. <laughs> OK, and uh, the idea is in the beginning, you're going to try and call out. Whoever's going to call out, you should raise your hand so I can identify you so we don't get multiple responses simultaneously, OK? And your job is uh, if you hear that, and then whatever, whatever they're identifying, then you take a step in either direction. Like you take, Taylor, you take a step on this side, and Peter, you take a step on the other side, right? Take small steps, just a small room. <laughs> OK, um, let's see. Um, so the idea is the first part, you're going to identify and identify differences if you can. And if you see any difference between them, can you quickly raise your hand? And I'll identify who can name it. How about yourself? Yes, girl. Girl? OK. All right. Tall. Tall. OK. Let me go on that side. Somebody had a hand up there? No? OK, go ahead. Facial hair? Huh? Facial, Facial hair? Yeah. OK. <laughs> OK. Lip piercing. Lip piercing. OK. Yeah, Chuck, I know you. So, OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes. Uh, Sorry? Less hair? Less hair? Nice hair. nice hair. I said, let's hair. They both have such a light head of hair. <laughs> that was me with my nice hair, sorry. <laughs> and I shouldn't know you as Marshmallow, so what is your name? Marino. Sorry? Marino. Marino, okay, Marino, thank you. Go ahead in the blue, right? You had your hand up? <gasps> Why not? <laughs> you can say it. Huh? Plaid. 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 <laughs> yes, to check out. Okay. Um, curly hair. Curly hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have curly hair. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Um, check shirt. 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 I think somebody said plaid. Plaid and check is the same. Okay. Blue shirt. Hmm? Blue shirt. Blue shirt. Yeah. Uh, skin tone. Skin tone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Both would move for skin tone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Anything else you see different? Okay. Short. Short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You had something. Shoes. Yeah. What about the shoes? shoes. shoes. Black okay. shoes and white sneakers. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So now, can for those of you who know, many of you know them as individuals as well. I think, right? 
So now can you find things, the ways in which they are similar? <coughs> yes. Intellectual. Intellectual? OK. There we go. Yeah, move back one step okay, inward. Thank you. That. Right. Go ahead. Confident. Confident. I guess both are confident. Yeah, take what? I'm confident. <laughs> well, you didn't know that, see? OK. There you go. Your friends know you're confident. People. Yeah. People? They're both people, OK? Yes, uh, Marino. Kind Sorry? Kind hearts. Kind hearts. Funny. Funny. <laughs> Did you have your hand up? Sorry. Oh, yeah. oh they already sorry about that. Student. Student. Outspoken. Outspoken. Funny. Child. What did you say? Child. Child? Oh, like, like, like oh, 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 like a child, a son or a daughter. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay. Did you have same word? Funny. Funny. Uh, they already. Okay. So, thanks so much, Cheryl. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Peter. <laughs> so now you have the task. So what does that identify? Um, in the first segment, what happened? You think? What did we? What did we all observe? Yeah. We observed um, what separates them. Yeah, and what separated them? All the differences. All the differences, right? So usually, I think in our humanity, it seems like all our differences are always separating us. So, and often we tend to focus on differences, and because we tend to focus on differences, we probably have <laughs> problems and conflicts and issues all of the time. And it's not just in the outside society, right? So maybe even in your families, you can see how if one person is different, maybe the rest of the family has a hard time accepting that one person. It doesn't only happen outside of families. It happens in families too, right? Uh, for example, can you think of something in any one of your families, something that happened that you think is probably creating cracks in the family, <laughs> tightly knit so picture? It's hard to share. Yes? Oh, hi. <laughs> when one, one member of the family has a drug problem. Right. Yeah, certainly when one member of the family might be addicted to a drug, it's very hard for every el everybody else to be understanding. They tend to isolate that person because of the difference, because that person doesn't have the same, we think, the same value, right? And maybe sometimes a family member is probably dating somebody who's of another whatever, class, race, <laughs> you know things like that, then that also seems to pull families apart, right? Because we're looking at differences as opposed to what we all value. Yes, go ahead. Uh, when, parents don't listen to children. when parents don't listen to their children, for example? Uh, Many of us are parents, so I think we want to know. <laughs> and sometimes when the children get mad and slash out the parents, the parents end up also rushing back to the children, but they don't ask their children what's wrong. Oh, I see, I see. OK, yes, yes, OK. Right. <laughs> that happens a lot. Um, OK. Divorce. Divorce, right. I mean, that certainly is an excellent example where maybe couples are not able to, they're focusing so much on the differences as opposed to seeing where they can join forces, right? So the second segment, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Uh, religion. Religion, for example. Uh, my family used to be like old school Italian, so they were all Catholic. And I had one gay uncle who was ostracized because of it. Oh, OK. Yeah. It's probably there are a couple of things in that. One, the religion, because Catholicism would not accept people who are gay. So therefore, automatically, because of the structure of a religion, a person, and therefore the family is following Catholicism, therefore they cannot accept their own child, right, because of that structure. And the other pieces we are also addressing is because he happens to be gay, so that's the sexual identity. It's not just an orientation, it's his identity. So because that is not acceptable, then he's getting ostracized. So there are two layers in that, right? And that would be really hard. Then it creates a hardship for everyone and all members of the family. So those are all the differences, and I'm sure there are many more. And, um, but then if we can focus on what's similar or more closely alike, you can see how physically everything, you're coming closer together to each one, right? So the challenge is for us always to see. So with the pair of you we had here, what are some of the things that brought them back together? Yes. Confidence. Confidence was one. Yeah. They were both smart. 
They were both smart. And what are all these smart, confident, kind, funny? Those are the things that I can remember. Adjectives? Yes. Emotions and personalities. They're all about personalities, and they're often not visible to the eye from the outside. So maybe if all of us focus less on what somebody looks like and what somebody dresses like, maybe there can be more hope for agreements. Do you think so? Because yeah. all the qualities you mentioned about for both of them had to do with uh, the interior of a person, right? Don't you think? So right, so that's what, what we think about. And maybe those are the things that really, do you think those are the attributes that make up a person? And the question is, can we take time to find out if what qualities one has? I think, I think that's right, because appearances can always change, but your thoughts and personality can always stay the same. Right. Mm -hmm. Your personality changes the same, and you're saying your thoughts change the same. I mean, I'm thinking, can we put that out for everyone? What do you think about thoughts? You think the thoughts would need, it's good for them to remain the same? Depending on the, Depending on the thoughts. <laughs> Right, right. When you reach that neutral ground, that's not bad. Either. Right. Um, and thoughts is very important. Why? I'm glad you brought up that word. <laughs> thoughts. To decide what actions you take. To decide what actions you take. Koda, mm -hmm. you were saying something? It makes a person who they are, who they are to everyone else, how they act, how they see the person. Yeah, so the thoughts are the seeds for all of your actions and your emotions, everything, right? So thoughts are very important, and hopefully uh, thoughts change. If they have negative thoughts, hopefully they are less and less negative thoughts, and thoughts can be more embracing of all people. I mean, where do you think all of us come with our thoughts at some point? Because we've all been socialized over the years, right? So, and that's important, but at some point you have to look at yourself and say, does this still apply when I'm with a diverse group of people? And maybe that's something each of us needs to do a little consciously. And what does it mean to be accepting of people of various backgrounds, all the various things you just identified over here? Right? Let's see, I'm trying to look at time. OK, I think I should get on with the next piece of that. OK. Um, I'm trying to think. Does anybody have anything you have particularly you want to say about the activity? Did it, did it, did it bring across the point clearly how similarities and dissimilarities can either <coughs> bring us together or tear us apart. And I think, uh, let's see if I can go to the, so maybe I should have Rex do that so I can just talk. <laughs> uh, so we, I didn't want to do a whole PowerPoint because we really wanted to do something that was interactive. So now there'll be a little more of that. But the way the room is set up, we couldn't do more group stuff here. So we had to finally get back to the PowerPoint a little bit. Um, Okay, maybe we should turn off the lights a little bit. Can you see that? There you go. Oh, <laughs> that's better. Okay, the reason we put this map up, can you take a guess? I'm going to move out of the way, I think. What's that? Yeah. Map of Asia. It's map of Asia. So can you identify some countries over there? There, you know, there are 44 countries in Asia. You didn't know that. <laughs> yeah? Okay, just go ahead. Yeah, go ahead in the front row. Go ahead. Bangladesh. Bangladesh, you're from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. India, Nepal, In Bhutan, Sri Lanka. Yeah. I think oh. I should stop also. Yeah, you should stop. <laughs> you will say all 44. Okay. So let's go. How far west does it go, Asia? How far west is Asia? What's the farthest west, you think? Yes, Koda. Sorry? Yep, it does go all the way to Jordan. And I didn't know, but even Israel is part of Asia, or was? Because Asia, I mean, Israel only became a country after. When was it? 1948. 48, right. I was going to say 47, but it's 48, right. So, right. So you're going as far west. And how far east are you going to be Asia? Japan. And then there's the whole block of Russia, right? So you can see Asia is huge. But you, you often, when you think about Asians, who are the people who come to your mind? Chinese. Yes, Chuck. Japanese. And yes, I think when you're in Cam certainly in Fall River, people certainly identify, not everywhere, but yeah, Cambodian, right. Yes. Sorry? Middle East, right. OK. So it's interesting to think how when the word Asia comes up, what, who comes to your mind first, that's something you need to think about. So you can expand that thought process to include more countries than just Japan and ch than Japanese and Chinese, right? 
Um, okay. Um, and what else do you think? What does it mean to be Asian, in your opinion? You can say things either nice or not nice is okay. Um, Asians, what are some of the things? We were going to do a whole thing on about uh, the kind of names Asians get called, but I didn't think we had time to go through that group process today. Yeah, go ahead. Strict childhood. Strict childhood, yeah, okay. Good students. Good students, says a faculty member. <laughs> really smart. Really smart. <laughs> so, okay, good students, really smart, strict childhood. Good math and agriculture. Yep. Good math and? And agricultural. And, and agricultural, okay. Farming. Or farming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are Asians, does, what does this do to you when you hear that this is the perception everybody has of Asians? Yeah, go ahead, all the way down there. <laughs> that is way, way, way too generalized. The, what is too generalized? What is too generalized? Say that again, sorry. Pass it on to someone, okay. Well, I think it, to some extent, uh, everybody does have general impressions of different groups, right? So we were trying to just get at that. That doesn't mean that is true or that's a fact. But in general, I think people do have a belief that Asians are smart, they're good at math. Um, that doesn't, but that does put a pressure on the young children, I think, right? Because if they want to be an artist or be something else, it, it's tough, 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 both family-wise as well as in perceptions. Just to give you an example, when I first came here in the 80s, right, I went to the refugee camp in Boston because I had an assignment like all of you do. So I said, this is one way to know what's going on. And I always wanted to work with the underserved. That's just me. So I went to Boston Refugee Camp. And there, they were assigning people for training, for work uh, to be, get employed. I asked him how he was deciding this, the manager of the training center for employing refugees who come into the United States, exactly by what you just said. Many of the Asians were all put into programs that had to do with computers and math. And the Russians were with languages and um, something else. So I thought, oh, that was interesting. That, at that point, I hadn't understood how you can be perceived and put into a box in the United States. And accordingly, your path may be changing that way. So you, that means if you don't want to be in that particular group, you have to very, work very hard against the tide to move out of it and still be successful. So I think it's um, interesting that. Does anybody else want to add to that one? So, so many of, yes, where was that? Did I see a hand? No. So many of you are in high school. I think talking to many people, both of Asian descent in Fall River and elsewhere, I hear you all have to put up with a lot of name calling by peers, right? And maybe, I know it might be hard for you to share that. I'm not putting anyone in that position because we are such a big group. It's not fair. But I think that's something to think about. Uh, when somebody does that kind of name calling, what does it do to your identity? And uh, where do you go for your own, um, where is your inner spirit? Where does it get grounded? So you can still, you know, not pay heed to that. You want to, don't want to acknowledge it, but also maybe in some ways you're listening all the time. So you have to figure out how to deal with that. What do you deal with that anger, you know? Because you know internally, just like you said, you're all different people, right? But just because somebody else says that, you have to somehow keep that at bay. And that's not easy for all of you who are young and you're still evolving and forming your identities. You have to work very hard. And you still want to have all your friendships. So it's a real challenge. You know? So you have somewhere to go. Because you find all of us need our social circles. So we did this Asia because this is Asia Student Association. And we thought it would be interesting. to So there are 44 countries in Asia. <laughs> I didn't know there were that many myself, actually. OK, so we can. <laughs> Yay, what is that? Yay, that's right. America. <laughs> is it America? <laughs> it is what? North America. It is North America, right. Our intention was to only get United States of America. Why would you think we were trying to do that? Let yes.
Uh huh. <laughs> okay. Right. Now, actually, the reason we were having United States of America is because is anybody here not a U.S. citizen? Yeah, you're okay. Otherwise, almost everybody is, right? But anyway, we are talking about being residents or citizens of United States. So we are looking at Asians and becoming US citizens. I'm not using the word Americas because to me, Americas is more than just United States, you know. So yes, so I think in a way we are trying to see what does it mean to be a US citizen? That means you're Asian and also you're a US citizen. So how do you negotiate that? Because now that's another layer of identity, right? We talked identity in a very simple way when we started out, correct? So now we are saying your identity is you're both wherever you're coming from, whichever, and this, we are only talking about Asia because of the association of student association. But everybody, either they have come recently as immigrants or people have come several generations ago, right? So what does it mean? That means everybody has more than one culture in a way, right? So what are some things uh, you think that is challenged by belonging to two cultural heritage? Yes. Languages. Languages, exactly. That's the first thing. How many of you here are negotiating <coughs> languages? English and what language is your? Spanish. Spanish. What do you speak? English yeah. and Bangla. English and Bangla. Are you? English and Bangla and many other languages. English, Bangla and many other languages. What are the others you're speaking? <coughs> Which of the Indian? Indian has or oh, Hindi? Okay. And also, I can speak Urdu. Urdu also, yeah. Okay. And mm -hmm. Spanish. And Spanish. Well, that's good. You've got so many. Okay. Uh, we can go to the next. Let's get into the Okay. We brought this up because I thought this was interesting because every, I mean, almost 99.9 .9 here are citizens. <laughs> So maybe it, I was curious to see if you know what are some of the symbolism of the United States flag. I mean, how many stripes does it have, you think? 13. Don't come. Huh? Uh, 13. 13. 13, yeah, and why do you think it has 13? 13. 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13 colonies. Well, somebody has a good history lesson, right? Yeah. OK, and what about the stars? The They're the states. And why are they stars and not moons or anything else? <laughs> why are they stars and nothing? It could be any other symbol, right? Why aren't they flowers or leaves or moons? I don't know. Because we're yeah. bright? Huh? Because we're bright? Because they're bright? <laughs> yes. Sky is the limit. You're kind of close, yeah, because I think everybody's saying <laughs> you're always reaching outward and to aspiring to be connected to the divine, to the divinity. So that's why you're looking up to the heavens. That's why it's the stars and not any other symbol, which was interesting to find out too, okay? Um, so I know everybody pledges allegiance to the flag, right? So what does it mean? So where do you, you know, so how do you seek power from the flag and its symbolism? Okay. Hmm? Freedom. Freedom, yeah. So that tells you that you have certain rights, right, within that. So maybe you have to also begin to claim that. And nobody's going to give it to you either. You know, so it's going to be a struggle when you have two cultures, right? And I'm trying to say not so much that, but you are trying to be or going to be or you already are in the process of evolving to become a US citizen. But at the same time, you're also trying to keep your Asian self, whatever that is for you, right? So that's, that's I think even parents are challenged by it. You are challenged by it. And I don't know, because I know when I first came here, I was talking to a lot of people who came here maybe soon after the World War I. A lot of people who are of Polish background, who are much older to me, they were very upset that so many people of the recent immigrants are able to speak their language and keep their culture. All of them had to give up, especially the Germans and the Polish. In the families, they stopped speaking the language. So you, if you sense some kind of um, heated arguments, in uh, public spaces, it's because of that, I think. Because some people had to really give up where they came from in order to become a part of United States. Have any of you worked in any settings where you have Native Americans? No, okay. Well, if you speak to them, you'll hear a lot about how much they had to give up. And that, of course, is really heart-wrenching. So then it puts our lives in a perspective, you know. Okay, we can go to the next one. Um, 
have any of you read this book? Now I'm trying to ground us into some of the historical perspectives and getting us rooted into thinking about being a US citizen and still being Asian and also acknowledging some of the history. So history is important if you want to understand why we are where we are. Uh, have any of you heard of Marion Wright Edelman? No? OK. Well, she's the founder director of Children's Defense Fund. It's in DC. And I think this is the best $7 you may ever spend in your life. And now it is probably only 4 because it was printed a long time ago. Um, and I think she has, this book is about her letters to her sons as they were becoming young adults. So she married a Jewish person. But when her children were turning 21, she said, what could I give them? They have everything now. Although she came from extremely impoverished background herself. But she was educated, and she's a strong civil rights movement person, worked in the South. The reason I'm sharing this is because she has wonderful, in her second part, 24 lessons. And they were, they're timeless. And uh, she writes letters to her children, and she says what they need to live up to. And that's all she gave. So that's how she wrote this book. If you haven't, then you should probably see if you can read it. It's really easy reading and great inspirational reading. So I also included her because she's African American. Um, and her family probably has faced slavery and all of that. So by reading hers, you get a good, quick understanding of what it means to have experienced the ramifications of slavery. It's hard when you read history books, it's one thing, but if you read it through her history, it comes alive. And maybe it's a way to understand how she has created her identity, and she's very successful in many different ways, but she also had to overcome a whole bunch of obstacles. Nothing was given to her at every end. She certainly experienced the whole segregation, the South segregation. So it's worth reading it. It's a simple, easy reading. And let's see. Oh, this is, I'm sharing with you some of my favorite books, I guess. Uh, any of you familiar with Miguel Ruiz? I want to see if anyone is, nobody, yeah, there, I guess Sue Bassano, yeah, there you go. Okay, this is the book many of my friends, children get at graduation <laughs> because it talks about the four agreements. Almost the first one is about the, power, the powerfulness of word, including the words you families use towards you, which is why I started with what nicknames you have, and how that stays with you. And uh, it basically is four circles. It almost identifies the four stages of human life, just about. And uh, it's a wonderful reading, uh, because it helps you look at your life in perspective, a journey, and you can take what you want. It's, it's not prescriptive. It's just a tool that can help you understand yourself, your circumstance, and try to figure out what you could do next. It doesn't give you answers, but helps you to think through, you know. And then I have one more, I think. Oh, is that? Oh, a cow. And we were trying to get to see if we can get something of an Asian philosopher in, so we came up with uh, Lao Tzu. And uh, are any of you familiar with his teachings or proverbs? Yeah? Yes, go ahead, uh, Peter. Uh, he's the founder of Taoism. Is he a founder of Taoism? Well, I think, I know, I'm not totally literate, but I think Taoism comes from many different people, not himself, right? We'll have to verify, but I think, I don't know where he is on that one. But he has a lot of leadership, uh, I mean, lots of proverbs that talks about uh, certainly your journey, and there are lots of proverbs, and uh, it's amazing. But that I have to check. I'm not sure if he's the one who started with Taoism. I don't believe so, but I could be wrong. Um, so we can go to the next one, I think. I'm looking at the time, too. OK. So we wanted to start. Where do you think this comes from? Anyone? Carl Young. Hmm? Carl Young. Carl Young. <laughs> Could be. But I think this is coming. I know those words are different, but the idea was to bring it. Uh, it is uh, the Native American spiritual wheel. And they have the, uh, the four winds, north, south, east, and west. That This is a modification of that. Um, and there's a slightly <coughs> different, but the whole idea in Native American is uh, all of us are connected, including the animals, the birds, the insects. 
So mm -hmm. part of it is always balancing all aspects of your life. The central piece as a human being is always striving for balance. And also about, that's why they're saying to be centered is really important. So certainly all of these aspects have been translated from the Native American uh, spiritual <coughs> wheel. And uh, I guess personally for me, since I've also worked with Native Americans for three years and lived in Fort Hall, Shoshone Bannock tribes, um, at that time I was very young and I didn't know and I regret it terribly now, but uh, I didn't know the policies of US at the time or even before, so I've learned more history now. So for me, it's always making sure I include them in whatever I do, because I think they were the first peoples here. And uh, maybe some of you should try, would like to read and know more about where they are today. They certainly are still struggling to come back. And uh, many of their elders have always told us that every time an old person dies, it's like a whole uh, book is lost, because they're losing their language, many of them. So it's a very sad, it's one of the black pages of US history. Uh, we can't deny history, but we can certainly try to help change it. Okay. I don't know, if you have questions, you should ask me now, because I thought, I know when we started this out, um, Rex thought I should talk about myself. I said, it's not about me. It's, I think our purpose is to see all you young people, what do you want to take away, and how you think it's going to help you. So I don't know if at this point you had any questions you can ask, otherwise we have one last slide, I think. Was that too much? <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, was it very difficult for you to assimilate into the American culture? Oh, I'm not sure I'm assimilated either. I <laughs> know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we maybe, um, it depends. Uh, probably you see I still wear whatever I was wearing from wherever I come from, which is India. Um, but I had to make a conscious decision after I went to graduate school and did my doctor degree and coming back to the workforce, what outfit I needed to wear. Even, you know, so I was wearing pants like all of you going to school, college, graduate school, which is fine, it doesn't matter, right, at that time. So I need to make a very conscious decision what I was going to wear. And then, of course, I seriously did try to go to these crazy stores and try to wear this two-piece suit, three-piece suit, God knows what. I couldn't figure out anything about the sizes. I was so frustrated. I said no, and I didn't like it at all. And I said, if I did something like that, then I wouldn't be the teacher that I am and I can be. Uh, because for me, what I wear is just like my skin. So I just had to stay with that, and, I, and I'm glad I did. But because of that, you do pay a price. You do pay a price. Uh, in terms of professional advancement, when you go for interviews, there are preferences. And when I go to an interview coach, and then the coach says, ma'am, if that's the way you're going to dress and you want to work in the United States, you're not going to get very far. So I had to come back home and think after she coaches me like that, how much of me do I want to give up? I wasn't willing to give up that part of me anymore. And I said, well, what matters to me is the values I have, not what I look like, what I dress, and that's what we say all the time, right? What you dress, what you look like, doesn't matter. But at certain point, in certain circles, it still matters. It still matters. That's just the truth. <laughs> at least it's my experience, not necessarily for everyone. Uh, and you know, you try to change, you can adapt, but you still look who you are. Even people who are Asian who wear three-piece suits, they've changed somewhat, but you know, but they still face some of those issues when they go. So for me, I couldn't change that. So maybe in a way I always stand out and one of my friends said, well, you're making a statement when you dress like that. I never thought I was making a statement. But looking from her perspective, I understand what she meant. But I, w I thought I was just living my life. But she said, no, you are making a statement. I mean, we did one of these exercises as faculty at another college. So she was trying to tell me what I'm, according to her, what am I projecting? I never looked at what I was projecting. It made me look at myself differently. That even though I'm not consciously doing, but because of just the way I am, I am projecting something all the time. So I've become more aware of that because of that exercise. Yeah. So yeah, I guess I have assimilated in some ways. Um, but maybe that part was always there. The sense of fairness and justice was always there somewhere, I think, long before I even came to States. And I would credit that to my mother, who also never went to college. But she had a very good sense of what's right and wrong. And fortunately for her, even if something happened in school, she would still come. And we had um, 
a principal who happened to be Italian descent in that school. But she listened. And um, she also called the teachers into the, her principal's room to settle the conflict. Nowadays, nobody does that. If you complain something, they listen to you, one. They listen to the other person separately. They never bring the two in the same room to s sort it out, which is interesting about justice, you know. So I think that's where it comes from. So for me, maybe that is important. And I think um, in the United States, you certainly have different ways of trying to seek. And that's unique. No matter where you come from, you can seek for uh, fairness, justice. Not that it comes easy. I'm not saying that. But there are pathways. You don't get shut down that easily. So I don't know. I know I didn't answer your full question. but Well, I, I suppose I could speak from the perspective of my daughter, too, right? I mean, she grew up here. I'm thinking, OK. For those of you who are growing up here, I think you really, really, really need to think about cultures, no matter which country, even if you go back to wherever you came from. In every country, there is a dominant culture and a non or a subordinate culture. So f I came here when my identity was fully set. But as she's growing up here, like many of you, identity forming with all these other layers and layers and layers, you know, both acceptance, rejections at different levels, right from kindergarten through high school through college and all of that. So hers is different, but we would always talk what it was like. And because I had taken some courses, I guess I was able to you know, openly discuss some things, what it means to be brown and the only brown person of being called chocolate. And I said, oh, you should just say chocolate tastes good. So what's wrong? So you, know, you don't have to take that message. You know, because she said, oh, and she came home crying, maybe kindergarten or first grade. And she said, oh, they call me chocolate. I'm not chocolate. And I think she got the message that she was being told that she is not white and black or brown is not good. She got that message. That's why she was crying. But I took the literal one and said, OK, you should go back tomorrow and say, chocolate tastes so good. So I'm really good. So we dealt with that for the first, <laughs> next two years, as long as we could. So, so at different levels, we negotiated that differently. And I'm sharing that only because so many of you may be going to various things, so if you want to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. What advice would you give to people to better like themselves? To better like themselves? That's enormous, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Question. Uh, better like yourself. OK. I guess one. F I have to first maybe find out why one doesn't like oneself. And where did one get that message that you're not good, that you don't like yourself, right? Um, I mean, there's always the question of size, shape, color, right? That makes a difference about not liking yourself. And somewhere along the line, somebody has reinforced that that size, shape, and color is not good whether it came from preschool, elementary school, middle school, <coughs> or maybe if it came all through, then it's very, very hard. It takes more to work it through unless you have somebody else with whom you can talk over time. I don't think it's that simple. That's why I think, as you know, I'm in early childhood education. For me, it's very important how my student teachers work with preschool children, especially some who have never seen somebody who's brown or somebody who's not dressed well and comes to school. Just last week, somebody came to the preschool in one of our Fall River public schools. The child looked uh, you know, unkept, came from a home that maybe people, mother and dad, were rushed or nobody had time. Really, hair wasn't combed. And uh, so one of the things, you know, but the child needed attention. It's not the child's fault, right? But somebody said, oh, you don't want to get too close to her. She really smells. And this is one of the adults in the room telling my student teacher. <laughs> I said, no, no matter what, you're going to have to find a way to still attend to this little one. You know? Um, yeah. Well, I have worked in uh, different places where I have cut children's toenails, fingernails, and have them washed. Because that's how you're showing children you still respect their spirit. It's not about what they look like. It's not their fault that nobody had time to cut their fingernails. What's wrong in doing that? I don't know. Anyway, that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> Right, so it's hard. So I'm, what I'm trying to answer your question is, you know, if people attend to that, then you're reinforcing one sense of self, and the sense of self is not coming from A, B, C, D, one, two, three, and getting A grade and B grade, right? Sometimes there are a lot of people who are getting A and B grades in Asian families that I know, even personally, who are totally unhappy afterwards, and a couple of them are. <coughs> 
probably suicidal in a couple of cases because that pressure was too much. So you want to really be careful. I know Asian families are strict, like you said. I know a lot of them are. <coughs> Any more questions? <laughs> yes. Social identity? Is that what you said? Yes, social identity. Especially in high school, there are cliques. They can express this the job, the wearing, the Oh, right. Right, there are various groups like that, the jocks and the, the ones, you know, the cheerleaders tend to be one group and then, you know. So what do you want me to comment on that? What do I, th I don't know if I have anything to think about it, they just exist, right? I mean, there's nothing I can do about that. They exist, right? I mean, all those different groups. As a parent, I guess if, I can only speak from the point of view of a parent, I suppose you want to be careful that your your children have enough other, or even you people have other activities where you're going to be involved so you don't have to be drawn into one of those uh, groups that are negative groups, you know? I think sometimes, I think there's this old uh, proverb, right? Devil's, uh, what's that? Advocate. Uh, no, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. We were told that a long time ago that, you know, and I think what um, Marion Wright Edelman's dad would say if you have nothing to do, assign yourself, which is the same thing. Assign yourself a task today. And if they didn't have something to do, he would assign them something to do. So they were never sitting idle. And I think that's what's important, especially for, and I think it's really good to have a lot of the out of school activities, which they keep cutting down uh, for people who have nowhere else to go sometimes and everything costs money. So I think that's really important. Um, yeah, we were kept very busy even though when I was growing up in India, I don't think we had, although we didn't have summer camps, but I think my mother was pretty good at figuring out how we were spending the day and we pretty much had to follow that through the day. So I think it's really important to keep everyone involved in doing something, right? I think uh, we have one last slide and then we can end it because it is four o'clock already. This is one of my most favorite, so maybe you can read it with me, that'll be good. It is the labyrinth of Solitude by Octavio Paz. What sets the world in motion is the interplay of differences, their attractions and their repulsions. Life is plurality, death is uniformity. By suppressing differences and peculiarities, by eliminating different civilizations, progress weakens life and favors death. The idea of a single civilization for everyone implicit in the cult of progress and technique impoverishes and mutilates us. Every view of the world becomes extinct. Every culture that disappears diminishes a, a possibility of life. I think that's a really powerful little poem from uh, Octavio Paz. I don't know if you know of him or not, but you might want to read some of his works. Yeah. Well, thank you all for listening to me and letting me share my perspectives on this. I appreciate it.